I'm William Murphine from uh, North Fermanagh, living down the land of Glassmuller. I'm married to Jean with two sons, uh, Paul and Trill. I'm a farmer and a uh, school bus driver. I'm in Tubbert RBP 1235 Lodge. I joined the UDR in uh, I joined the UDR early on in the stages because uh, at that time the troubles were flaring up and there was a lot of activity in the border areas and farmers were leaving their farms moving in lands and I thought that maybe by joining I could do something to help the local community. I joined the UDR in the old uh, TA centre in Enniskillen. At that time uh, we then moved when we started our training to St Angelo. We served in uh, North Fermanagh from Balna Mullard to the lake, down to Pettigo, all around that uh, North Fermanagh border area. Occasionally we might have uh, operated up close to Enniskillen, but our main patch was in uh, North Fermanagh, like Edernay, Cash, Hermiston, Pettigo. The most uh, prominent incident to myself while I was on the UDR was uh, an attempt on my own life. That was uh, Remembrance Sunday when uh, three armed and masked men arrived at a farmhouse just about a quarter of a mile from where I live. With two elderly brothers lived there and uh, it was about half past twelve. They knocked on the door and one of the men were in bed, the other man wasn't. He up answered the door and uh, the three armed men burst in past them, told them they were the IRA, they were staying there till morning and to not resist and there would be no harm come to them. Uh, they then looked around them and they didn't see the other man, obviously they knew there should have been two. So they asked him, where's your brother? He says he's in bed. So. They sent the other two men up. They said, go and get them. So they went up, put them out of bed, and brought them down and sat them on a chair and told them to stay there. Of course, he was frightened and kept asking what were they doing, why were they there. Again, they reassured him to do as they say, that nothing would ha happen to them and would be under no harm. So then the leader, he seemed to walk over and he pulled the telephone out of the wall, threw it down on the floor and again told them to do nothing and only as they said. So that was fine. They went on through the night talking among themselves and the other two men just observing them very little conversation between them, he said, and uh, then about three o'clock, one of them produced a small bag, he emptied the contents out onto the floor, and as they said, it was a lot of bullets, we would call them ammunition, so the two men that had two long guns, he said, they started to pick up the rounds and clean them with a the cloth and dry them off, and one by one they placed them in a magazine each. When the magazine was full, they sat it down on the floor and filled another one. So they went on until they had two magazines each filled. They then broke down their weapons and cleaned them, oiled them, pulled out the barrels, he said. And then they placed a magazine on each weapon, put it under the chair. And all the time, the other man, he sat with a small gun on his knee, just keeping him covered. And uh, on before morning, maybe about six o'clock or so, 
the two men with the two long guns, they got up and tightened up their jackets and went outside with their guns. Never saw them again, they never came in again. Uh, Special Branch believed that they would have went out to observe just in case there would be army or police patrols on the road because that was one of the questions they asked after they came in. You know, does there be any army patrols on this road? The men said the doors. Then, uh, at that time, I was uh, a bus driver, as I said, and I was uh, leaving the house at about half past eight in the morning because I was only going to a local school. And uh, the other man that was left... He was the driver, he was the driver of the car. He kept watching the clock and watching his watch. And at five past eight, I think he said it was, yeah, five past eight, he went out and was leaving. And he told the mothers, he says, don't leave this house for one hour now after I leave. And as he was going, he picked up the boots belonging to one of the men that was in the, at the back door and he threw them down the street. And... Uh, they said nothing, observed just and heard the car starting up, went off the street, went very short driveway onto the road, turned up the road in my direction, and as soon as it left, the man whose boots they threw out, he went out of the door, picked up his boots, put them on, headed across the fields, and uh, he had quite a distance to go. To the neighbour's house, but uh, he was out of sight of the road, so he was relatively safe at that stage. He was on the way down from the road, and uh, he continued on and on until he made it out to, uh, onto a laneway and along to the neighbour's house. And he raised the alarm there by telling them the area had been in the house all night, and they were away in his car, and they were away in my direction. Could he? For me, so at that time uh, they believed the plan was that uh, the boys in the car would be sitting up a lane close to where I lived, uh, where they had full view of uh, my bus and me leaving the house. And what their plan was, as soon as I would leave the house, I would only a short distance to go to the road. They would be on the road then, driving up the road. So me having a full size bus, I wasn't going to drive out onto the road and uh, meet a car on the road. Uh, so I'd sit and wait till the car went past. But obviously their idea would have been that they would have went three quarter ways past, opened up with their two weapons and uh, that would have been another story. Uh, but, well, we knew that they had planned for that because the back window had been removed out of the car when she was found and was intact, sitting on the back seat. So, uh, actually, I was due to leave the house then, as I say, at half past eight, but uh, I was out in the bus, had her started up, revving her up, so there'd been a bit of smoke out of the same type of buses after you started, so there's no bother knowing when I was about to leave. Uh, but just as uh, I was about to leave, my wife came out to the door and she called that I was wanted on the phone. So I ran out of the house and, uh, of course, it was my neighbour. He says uh, the area has been in the neighbour's house all night. They're away in this car in your direction. You want to be careful. So I didn't obviously go back out to the bus. I rang the cell in St. Angelo rang the RUC in cash and uh, they kept me on the phone, didn't let me off, told me not to go out of course, if I had a weapon to get it and I already had it in the household. Uh, the hostage of the house and the neighbour were still standing on the street and now as the time had went past when I should have been approaching the road or should have been down they obviously got uh, frightened or thought something had went wrong. So they packed up and left and uh, the 
two boys saw the car go down the road at highly speed. They were away, the target didn't appear. So uh, that was as close as uh, you could get to be. Yes, uh, very much indeed, thanks to uh, my neighbours, the two uh, gentlemen, two Roman Catholics, and when I came back uh, that evening after interviews with the police and all the rest, I went down, met them, and uh, they told me the whole story, uh, everything I was told you there, so it's all fact, there's nothing added or nothing taken away. Uh, I could say only for them I wouldn't be here. Uh, would I do it all again? Yes, certainly would. Uh, one or two incidents in 30 years isn't all that much. and I had a lot of good times in the UDR, made a lot of friends, uh, achieved a lot for myself and uh, highlights of it were I represented my company Battalion and Regiment at the Festival of Remembrance at the Royal Albert Hall, which was a wonderful experience and honoured to do it. And many other occasions we made many friends through the UDR.